history. That's the that's the history dance. Summon history by way of waving and flapping vigorously. Hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of Changeling Tales. So today's video has special historical significance. The story that we'll be reading today is called The Bluebird, and it was first published in 1697 in France and was written by Madame de... I don't speak French and I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Marie Catherine Le Jumel de Barneville, Baroness d'Olnoy. I've made it worse, haven't I? I'm trying. So she was born in either 1650 or 1651 and passed away in 1705. So let's go back a few centuries to the 1600s. This was actually about the time that fairy tales were born. Of course, folk tales, folk legends, myths had been around forever, but this was the first time that the term or genre of fairy tales came to be. And the term fairy tale was actually coined by Madame Dolnoy, and she used it to describe the tales she wrote to amuse the court, or amuse court members at soirees. This fairy tale and others that she wrote were apparently analogies for intrigue in the courts, gossip, that sort of thing. And you'll see that in this story definitely, the interfering of people and control and manipulation and courts and stuff. High places, intrigue. So something that makes her stories in particular different from our modern idea of fairy tales is that she didn't write them for children, first and foremost. Also, whether or not they were based on previous folklore, traditions that had been passed down for centuries, is unknown. She might have just come up with all the material herself, and then written them in such a way as to mimic the works of Charles Perrault, who was also a French author, fantastical author, a couple of decades before her, and his stories, while well, we term them as fairy tales today, were stories that were based on half-remembered folk tales from his childhood and people he knew, and he recorded these tales so that he could read them aloud to his children. Charles Perrault wrote, or recorded, a lot of very popular and well-known fairy tales like Little Red Riding Hood, Sleeping Beauty, Bluebeard, tons, and we'll get to them. My point is, 1600s France is where fairy tales as a genre were born. Folk tales inspired them, but fairy tales as we know them today started then. And the tradition of writing fantastical stories or fairy tales carried on through 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and then kind of dwindled off. The end of the 1800s is kind of where you see the last of the long form fairy tale tradition. And from there, as time carried on into the 1900s, that's when the fantasy genre and sci-fi genres and horror genres all came in and kind of took the place of fairy tales. I mean, obviously they had had their roots before 1900, but they became more popular as fairy tales dwindled. So looking at the Bluebird story in particular, written by the mother of the fairy tales genre, you can see a lot of things in the story that become tropes later on through the centuries. And whether or not these tropes predecessed Madame Dolnoy or were created or started with her, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll learn that as I continue to delve into fairy tales. But definitely if you stick around to see more of these videos and hear more of these stories, you'll notice that a lot of the things that happen in this story 
do happen in many other stories as well. Now, The Blue Bird is a very, 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 very long story compared to many other fairy tales. So just a few words about why I like this story in particular and why I wanted to share it with you. So firstly, I like it because it is the most classic of classic romances you can get. And I may not seem like it, but I really like me a good classical romance. With all the silliness of love at first sight and willing to die for the other person after you've known them for 20 minutes, I don't know. I just like it. like to read about it. Not so much in real life, but in real life it's just dumb. But in the fairy tale world, it's very fun, I think. Also, I just like the fact that the author has a rather dark sense of humor at times that comes through her writing. I know that even from the first page, there were certain moments that I was just like, <laughs> how could you say that? <laughs> That's terrible. But I also kind of found it funny because at times I guess I can be a terrible person too. As it goes. And I wonder too if the author, she named the romantic lead guy King Charming. And to me, he's a, he's a bit of a <coughs> So uh, I wonder, being that she had a bit of a sardonic style or what you could call a dark sense of humor, I wonder if that was ironic to her or if she meant it. I don't know. Seems ironic to me. And there's one thing about the story that I wanted to point out that you used to see in fairy tales all the time but don't see anymore and I think that's a good thing, is the association of an ugly visage person face with an ugly personality and a beautiful face with a beautiful personality. It was like people assumed back then that if you were pretty, you would be nice. And if you were not as suited to societal standards of beauty, then most likely you were not such a good person. And that obviously is a trope that I'm glad has died. Or at least it has for the most part. It would be nice to see more children's movies, fairy tale-ish movies, and TV shows where the main characters didn't meet societal beauty standards. I would really appreciate that. I think it'd be great. And I think that media is maybe very slightly in some ways moving in that direction, but that's questionable. Hopefully it's something that we will see more of though. So I hope you will all enjoy this kind of wonderful, kind of weird love story. Just take it as it is let it happen. So get yourself some tea, wrap yourself in a blanket, light a candle, do whatever makes you comfy, and let's go. The Blue Bird once upon a time, there lived a king who was immensely rich. He had broad lands and sacks overflowing with gold and silver, but he did not care a bit for all his riches because the queen, his wife, was dead. He shut himself up in a little room and knocked his head against the walls for grief until his courtiers were really afraid that he would hurt himself. So they hung feather beds between the tapestry and the walls, and then he could go on knocking his head as long as it was any consolation to him without coming to much harm. All his subjects came to see him and said whatever they thought would comfort him. Some were grave, even gloomy with him, and some agreeable, even gay, but not one could make the least impression upon him. Indeed, he hardly seemed to hear what they said. At last came a lady who was wrapped in a black mantle and seemed to be in the deepest grief. She wept and sobbed until even the king's attention was attracted. And when she said that, far from coming to try and diminish his grief, 
She, who had just lost a good husband, was coming to add her tears to his, since she knew what he must be feeling. The king redoubled his lamentations. Then he told the sorrowful lady long stories about the good qualities of his departed queen, and she in her turn recounted all the virtues of her departed husband. And this passed the time so agreeably that the king quite forgot to thump his head against the feather beds, and the lady did not need to wipe the tears from her great blue eyes as often as before. By degrees they came to talking about other things, in which the king took an interest, and in a wonderfully short time the whole kingdom was astonished by the news that the king was married again to the sorrowful lady. Now the king had one daughter, who was just fifteen years old. Her name was Fiordalisa, and she was the prettiest and most charming princess imaginable, always gay and merry. The new queen, who also had a daughter, very soon sent for her to come to the palace. Turatella, for that was her name, had been brought up by her godmother, the fairy Mazilla. But in spite of all the care bestowed upon her, she was neither beautiful nor gracious. Instead, when the queen saw how ill-tempered and ugly she appeared beside Fiordalisa, she was in despair and did everything in her power to turn the king against his own daughter in the hope that he might take a fancy to Turatella. One day the king said that it was time Fiordalisa and Turatella were married, so he would give one of them to the first suitable prince who visited his court. The queen answered, "'My daughter certainly ought to be the first to be married. She is older than yours and a thousand times more charming.' The king, who hated disputes, said, Very well, it's no affair of mine. Settle it your own way. Very soon after came the news that King Charming, who was the most handsome and magnificent prince in all the country round, was on his way to visit the king. As soon as the queen heard this, she set all her jewelers, tailors, weavers, and embroiderers to work upon splendid dresses and ornaments for Turatella but she told the king that Fiordalisa had no need of anything new, and the night before the king was to arrive she bribed her waiting woman to steal away all the princess's own dresses and jewels, so that when the day came and Fiordalisa wished to adorn herself as became her high rank, not even a ribbon could she find. However, as she easily guessed who had played her such a trick, she made no complaint but sent to the merchants for some rich stuffs. But they said that the queen had expressly forbidden them to supply her with any, and they dared not disobey. So the princess had nothing left to put on but the little white frock she had been wearing the day before, and dressed in that she went down when the time of the king's arrival came, and sat in a corner hoping to escape notice. The queen received her guest with great ceremony and presented him to her daughter, who was gorgeously attired, but so much splendor only made her ugliness more noticeable, and the king, after one glance at her, looked the other way. The queen, however, only thought that he was bashful, and took pains to keep Turatella in full view. King Charming then asked if there was not another princess called Fiordalisa. Yes, said Turatella, pointing with her finger. There she is, trying to keep out of sight because she is not smart. At this Fiordalisa blushed and looked so shy and so lovely that the king was fairly astonished. He rose and, bowing low before her, said, Madam, your incomparable beauty needs no adornment. Sire, answered the princess, I assure you that I am not in the habit of wearing dresses as crumpled and untidy as this one, so I should have been better pleased if you had not seen me at all. Impossible, cried King Charming. Wherever such a marvelously beautiful princess appears, I can look at nothing else. Here the queen broke in, saying sharply, I assure you, sire, that Fiordalisa is vain enough already. Pray, make her no more flattering speeches. The king quite understood that she was not pleased, but that did not matter to him. So he admired Fiordalisa to his heart's content and talked to her for three hours without stopping. The queen was in despair and so was Turatella when they saw how much the king preferred Fiordalisa. They complained bitterly to the king and begged and teased him until he at last consented to have the princess shut up somewhere out of sight while King Charming's visit lasted. So that night, as she went to her room, she was seized by four masked figures and carried up into the topmost room of a high tower where they left her in the deepest dejection. She easily guessed that she was to be kept out of sight for fear the king should fall in love with her. But then, how disappointing that was, for she already liked him very much and would have been quite willing to be chosen for his bride. As King Charming did not know what had happened to the princess, he looked forward impatiently to meeting her again, and he tried to talk about her with the courtiers who were placed in attendance on him. 
but by the Queen's orders they would say nothing good of her, but declared that she was vain, capricious, and bad-tempered, that she tormented her waiting maids, and that in spite of all the money that the king gave her, she was so mean that she preferred to go about dressed like a poor shepherdess rather than spend any of it. All these things vexed the king very much, and he was silent. It is true, thought he, that she was very poorly dressed, but then she was so ashamed that it proves that she was not accustomed to be so. I cannot believe that with that lovely face she can be as ill-tempered and contemptible as they say. No, no, the queen must be jealous of her for the sake of that ugly daughter of hers, and so these evil reports are spread. The courtiers could not help seeing that what they had told the king did not please him, and one of them cunningly began to praise Fiordalisa when he could talk to the king without being heard by the others. King Charming thereupon became so cheerful and interested in all he said that it was easy to guess how much he admired the princess. So when the queen sent for the courtiers and questioned them about all they had found out, their report confirmed her worst fears. As to the poor princess Fiordalisa, she cried all night without stopping. It would have been quite bad enough to be shut up in this gloomy tower before I had even seen King Charming, she said. But now when he is here and they're all enjoying themselves with him, it is too unkind. The next day, the queen sent King Charming splendid presents of jewels and rich stuffs, and among other things, an ornament made expressly in honor of the approaching wedding. It was a heart cut out of one huge ruby, and was surrounded by several diamond arrows and pierced by one. A golden true lover's knot above the heart bore the motto, But one can wound me. And the whole jewel was hung upon a chain of immense pearls. Never since the world has been a world had such a thing been made, and the king was quite amazed when it was presented to him. The page who brought it begged him to accept it from the princess, who chose him to be her knight. What? cried he. Does the lovely princess Fiordalisa dine to think of me in this amiable and encouraging way? You confuse the names, sire, said the page hastily. I come on behalf of the princess Turritella. Oh, it is Turritella who wishes me to be her knight, said the king coldly. I am sorry that I cannot accept the honor. And he sent the splendid gifts back to the queen and Turritella, who were furiously angry at the contempt with which they were treated. As soon as he possibly could, King Charming went to see the king and queen, and as he entered the hall he looked for Fiordalisa, and every time anyone came in he started round to see who it was and was altogether so uneasy and dissatisfied that the queen saw it plainly. But she would not take any notice, and talked of nothing but the entertainments she was planning. The prince answered at random, and presently asked if he was not to have the pleasure of seeing the princess Fiordalisa. Sire, answered the queen haughtily, her father has ordered that she shall not leave her own apartments until my daughter is married. What can be the reason for keeping that lovely princess a prisoner? cried the king in great indignation. That I do not know, answered the queen, and even if I did, I might not feel bound to tell you. The king was terribly angry at being thwarted like this. He felt certain that Turritella was to blame for it, so casting a furious glance at her, he abruptly took leave of the queen and returned to his own apartments. There he said to a young squire whom he had brought with him, I would give all I have in the world to gain the goodwill of one of the princess's waiting women, and obtain a moment's speech with Fiordalisa. Nothing could be easier, said the young squire, and he very soon made friends with one of the ladies, who told him that in the evening Fiordalisa would be at a little window which looked into the garden, where he could come and talk to her. Only, she said, he must take very great care not to be seen, as it would be as much as her place was worth to be caught helping King Charming to see the princess. The squire was delighted and promised all she asked, but the moment he had run off to announce his success to the king, the false waiting woman went and told the queen all that had passed. She at once determined that her own daughter should be at the little window, and she taught her so well all she was to say and do that even the stupid Turritella could make no mistake. The night was so dark that the king had not a chance of finding out the trick that was being played upon him, so he approached the window with the greatest delight, and said everything that he had been longing to say to Fiordalisa to persuade her of his love for her. Turritella answered as she had been taught, that she was very unhappy, and that there was no chance of her being better treated by the queen until her daughter was married. And then the king entreated her to marry him, and thereupon he drew his ring from his finger and put it upon Turritella's, and she answered him as well as she could. 
The king could not help thinking that she did not say exactly what he would have expected from his darling Fiordalisa, but he persuaded himself that the fear of being surprised by the queen was making her awkward and unnatural. He would not leave her until she had promised to see him again the next night, which Turritella did willingly enough. The queen was overjoyed at the success of her stratagem, and promised herself that all would now be as she wished, and sure enough, as soon as it was dark the following night, the king came, bringing with him a chariot which had been given him by an enchanter who was his friend. This chariot was drawn by flying frogs, and the king easily persuaded Turritella to come out and let him put her into it, then mounting beside her he cried triumphantly, Now, my princess, you are free! Where will it please you that we shall hold our wedding? And Turritella, with her head muffled in her mantle, answered that the fairy Mazilla was her godmother, and that she would like it to be at her castle. So the king told the frogs, who had the map of the whole world in their heads, and very soon he and Turritella were set down at the castle of the fairy Mazilla. The king would certainly have found out his mistake the moment they stepped into the brilliantly lighted castle, but Turritella held her mantle more closely round her, and asked to see the fairy by herself, and quickly told her all that had happened, and how she had succeeded in deceiving King Charming. Oh, oh, my daughter, said the fairy. I see we have no easy task before us. He loves Fiordalisa so much that he will not be easily pacified. I feel sure he will defy us. Meanwhile, the king was waiting in a splendid room with diamond walls, so clear that he could see the fairy and Turritella as they stood whispering together, and he was very much puzzled. Who can have betrayed us? he said to himself. How comes our enemy here? She must be plotting to prevent our marriage. Why doesn't my lovely Fiordalisa make haste and come back to me? But it was worse than anything he had imagined when the fairy Mazilla entered, leading Turritella by the hand, and said to him, King Charming, here is the princess Turritella to whom you have plighted your faith. Let us have the wedding at once. I, cried the king, I marry that little creature? What do you take me for? I have promised her nothing. Say no more. Have you no respect for a fairy? cried she angrily. Yes, madam, answered the king. I am prepared to respect you as much as a fairy can be respected if you will give me back my princess. Am I not here? interrupted Turritella. Here is the ring you gave me. With whom did you talk at the little window if it was not with me? What? cried the king angrily. Have I been altogether deceived and deluded? Where is my chariot? Not another moment will I stay here. Oh, said the fairy. Not so fast. And she touched his feet, which instantly became as firmly fixed to the floor as if they had been nailed there. Oh, do whatever you like with me, said the king. You may turn me to stone, but I will marry no one but Fiordalisa. And not another word would he say, though the fairy scolded and threatened, and Turritella wept and raged for twenty days and twenty nights. At last the fairy Mazilla said furiously, for she was quite tired out by his obstinacy, Choose whether you will marry my goddaughter, or do penance for seven years for breaking your word to her. And then the king cried gaily, Pray do whatever you like with me, as long as you deliver me from this ugly scold. Scold? cried Turritella angrily. Who are you, I should like to know, that you dare to call me a scold? A miserable king who breaks his word and goes about in a chariot drawn by croaking frogs out of a marsh? Let us have no more of these insults, cried the fairy. Fly from that window, ungrateful king, and for seven years be a blue bird. As she spoke, the king's face altered, his arms turned to wings, his feet to little crooked black claws. In a moment, he had a slender body like a bird, covered with shining blue feathers. His beak was like ivory, his eyes were bright as stars, and a crown of white feathers adorned his head. As soon as the transformation was complete, the king uttered a dolorous cry and fled through the open window, pursued by the mocking laughter of Turritella and the fairy Mazilla. He flew on until he reached the thickest part of the wood, and there, perched upon a cypress tree, he bewailed his miserable fate. Alas, in seven years who knows what may happen to my darling Fiordalisa, he said. Her cruel stepmother may have married her to someone else before I am myself again, and then what good will life be to me? In the meantime, the fairy Mazilla had sent Turritella back to the queen, who was all anxiety to know how the wedding had gone off. 
but when her daughter arrived and told her all that had happened, she was terribly angry, and of course all her wrath fell upon Fiordelisa. She shall have cause to repent that the king admires her, said the queen, nodding her head meaningly, and then she and Turritella went up to the little room in the tower where the princess was imprisoned. Fiordelisa was immensely surprised to see that Turritella was wearing a royal mantle and a diamond crown, and her heart sank when the queen said, My daughter has come to show you some of her wedding presents, for she is King Charming's bride, and they are the happiest pair in the world. He loves her to distraction. All this time Turritella was spreading out lace and jewels and rich brocades and ribbons before Fiordelisa's unwilling eyes, and taking good care to display King Charming's ring, which she wore upon her thumb. The princess recognized it as soon as her eyes fell upon it, and after that she could no longer doubt that he had indeed married Turritella. In despair she cried, "'Take away these miserable gods! What pleasure has a wretched captive in the sight of them!' And then she fell insensible upon the floor, and the cruel queen laughed maliciously, and went away with Turritella, leaving her there without comfort or aid. That night the queen said to the king that his daughter was so infatuated with King Charming, in spite of his never having shown any preference for her, that it was just as well she should stay in the tower until she came to her senses, to which he answered that it was her affair and she could give what orders she pleased about the princess. When the happy Fiordelisa recovered and remembered all that she had just heard, she began to cry bitterly, believing that King Charming was lost to her forever and all night long she sat at her open window, sighing and lamenting. But when it was dawn, she crept away into the darkest corner of her little room and sat there, too unhappy to care about anything. As soon as night came again, she once more leaned out into the darkness and bewailed her miserable lot. Now it happened that King Charming, or rather, the Blue Bird, had been flying round the palace in the hope of seeing his beloved princess, but had not dared to go too near the windows for fear of being seen and recognized by Turritella. When night fell, he had not succeeded in discovering where Fiordelisa was imprisoned, and weary and sad, he perched upon a branch of a tall fir tree, which grew close to the tower, and began to sing himself to sleep. But soon the sound of a soft voice lamenting attracted his attention, and listening intently, he heard it say, "'Ah, cruel queen! What have I ever done to be imprisoned like this? And was I not unhappy enough before that you must needs come and taunt me with the happiness your daughter is enjoying now she is King Charming's bride? The bluebird, greatly surprised, waited impatiently for the dawn, and the moment it was light flew off to see who it could have been who spoke thus. But he found the window shut and could see no one. The next night, however, he was on the watch, and by the clear moonlight he saw that the sorrowful lady at the window was Fiordelisa herself. "'My princess, have I found you at last?' said he, alighting close to her. "'Who is speaking to me?' cried the princess in great surprise. "'Only a moment since you mentioned my name, and now you do not know me, Fiordelisa,' said he sadly. "'But no wonder, since I am nothing but a blue bird, and must remain one for seven years.' "'What? Little blue bird, are you really the powerful King Charming?' said the princess, caressing him. "'It is too true,' he answered. "'For being faithful to you I am thus punished.' But believe me, if it were for twice as long, I would bear it joyfully rather than give you up. Oh, what are you telling me? cried the princess. Has not your bride, Turritella, just visited me wearing the royal mantle and the diamond crown you gave her? I cannot be mistaken, for I saw your ring upon her thumb. Then the bluebird was furiously angry and told the princess all that had happened, how he had been deceived into carrying off Turritella and how, for refusing to marry her, the fairy Mozilla had condemned him to be a blue bird for seven years. The princess was very happy when she heard how faithful her lover was, and would never have tired of hearing his loving speeches and explanations, but too soon the sun rose, and they had to part lest the blue bird should be discovered. After promising to come again to the princess's window as soon as it was dark, he flew away and hid himself in a little hole in the fir tree, while Fiordelisa remained devoured by anxiety lest he should be caught in a trap or eaten up by an eagle. But the blue bird did not long stay in his hiding place. He flew away and away until he came to his own palace and got into it through a broken window, and there he found the cabinet where his jewels were kept, and chose out a splendid diamond ring as a present for the princess. 
By the time he got back, Fiordelisa was sitting, waiting for him by the open window, and when he gave her the ring, she scolded him gently for having run such a risk to get it for her. "'Promise me that you will wear it always,' said the blue bird. And the princess promised on condition that he should come and see her in the day as well as by night. They talked all night long, and the next morning the blue bird flew off to his kingdom and crept into his palace through the broken window and chose from his treasures two bracelets, each cut out of a single emerald. When he presented them to the princess, she shook her head at him reproachfully, saying, Do you think I love you so little that I need all these gifts to remind me of you? And he answered, No, my princess, but I love you so much that I feel I cannot express it try as I may. I only bring you these worthless trifles to show you that I have not ceased to think of you, though I have been obliged to leave you for a time. The following night he gave Fiordelisa a watch set in a single pearl. The princess laughed a little when she saw it, and said, You may well give me a watch, for since I have known you I have lost the power of measuring time. The hours you spend with me pass like minutes, and the hours that I drag through without you seem years to me. Ah, princess, they cannot seem so long to you as they do to me, he answered. Day by day he brought more beautiful things for the princess, diamonds and rubies and opals, and at night she decked herself with them to please him, but by day she hid them in her straw mattress. When the sun shone, the blue bird, hidden in the tall fir tree, sang to her so sweetly that all the passers-by wondered, and said that the wood was inhabited by a spirit. And so two years slipped away, and still the princess was a prisoner, and Turritella was not married. The queen had offered her hand to all the neighboring princes, but they always answered that they would marry Fiordelisa with pleasure, but not Turritella on any account. This displeased the queen terribly. Fiordelisa must be in league with them to annoy me, she said. Let us go and accuse her of it. So she and Turritella went up into the tower. Now it happened that it was nearly midnight, and Fiordelisa, all decked with jewels, was sitting at the window with a blue bird. And as the queen paused outside the door to listen, she heard the princess and her lover singing together a little song he had just taught her. These were the words. Oh, what a luckless pair are we, one in a prison and one in a tree. All our trouble and anguish came from our faithfulness spoiling our enemy's game. But vainly they practice their cruel arts, for naught can sever our two fond hearts. They sound melancholy, perhaps, but the two voices sang them gaily enough, and the queen burst open the door, crying, Ah, my Turritella, there is some treachery going on here. As soon as she saw her, Fiordelisa, with great presence of mind, hastily shut her little window that the blue bird might have time to escape, and then turned to meet the queen, who overwhelmed her with a torrent of reproaches. Your intrigues are discovered, madam, she said furiously. "'and you need not hope that your high rank will save you from the punishment you deserve.' "'And with whom do you accuse me of intriguing, madam?' said the princess. "'Have I not been your prisoner these two years? "'And who have I seen except the gaulers sent by you?' "'While she spoke, the queen and Turritella were looking at her in the greatest surprise, "'perfectly dazzled by her beauty and the splendor of her jewels. "'And the queen said, "'If one may ask, madam,' Where did you get all these diamonds? Perhaps you mean to tell me that you have discovered a mine of them in the tower. I certainly did find them here, answered the princess. And pray, said the queen, her wrath increasing every moment. For whose admiration are you decked out like this, since I have often seen you not half as fine on the most important occasions at court? For my own, answered Fiordelisa. You must admit that I have had plenty of time on my hands, so you cannot be surprised at my spending some of it and making myself smart. That's all very fine, said the queen suspiciously. I think I will look about and see for myself. So she and Turritella began to search every corner of the little room, and when they came to the straw mattress, out fell such a quantity of pearls, diamonds, rubies, opals, emeralds, and sapphires, that they were amazed and could not tell what to think. But the queen resolved to hide somewhere a packet of false letters to prove that the princess had been conspiring with the king's enemies, and she chose the chimney as a good place. Fortunately for Fiordelisa, this was exactly where the blue bird had perched himself, to keep an eye upon her proceedings, and try to avert danger from his beloved princess. And now he cried, Beware, Fiordelisa, your false enemy is plotting against you. 
The strange voice so frightened the queen that she took the letter and went away hastily with Turritella, and they held a council to try and devise some means of finding out what fairy or enchanter was favoring the princess. At last they sent one of the queen's maids to wait upon Fiordelisa, and told her to pretend to be quite stupid, and to see and hear nothing, while she was really to watch the princess day and night, and keep the queen informed of all her doings. Poor Fiordelisa, who so guessed she was sent as a spy, was in despair, and cried bitterly that she dared not see her dear blue bird for fear that some evil might happen to him if he were discovered. The days were so long and the nights so dull, but for a whole month she never went near her little window lest he should fly to her as he used to do. However, at last the spy, who had never taken her eyes off the princess day or night, was so overcome with weariness that she fell into a deep sleep, and as soon as the princess saw that, she flew to open her window and cried softly, Blue bird, blue as the sky, fly to me now, there's nobody by. And the blue bird, who had never ceased to flutter round within sight and hearing of her prison, came in an instant. They had so much to say, and were so overjoyed to meet once more, that it scarcely seemed to them five minutes before the sun rose, and the blue bird had to fly away. But the next night the spy slept as soundly as before, so that the blue bird came, and he and the princess began to think they were perfectly safe, and to make all sorts of plans for being happy as they were before the queen's visit. But, alas, the third night the spy was not quite so sleepy, and when the princess opened her window and cried as usual, Blue bird, blue as the sky, fly to me now, there's nobody nigh. She was wide awake in a moment, though she was sly enough to keep her eyes shut at first. But presently she heard voices, and peeping cautiously, she saw by the moonlight the most lovely blue bird in the world, who was talking to the princess while she stroked and caressed it fondly. The spy did not lose a single word of the conversation, and as soon as the day dawned, and the blue bird had reluctantly said goodbye to the princess, she rushed off to the queen and told her all she had seen and heard. Then the queen sent for Turritella, and they talked it over, and very soon came to the conclusion that this blue bird was no other than King Charming himself. "'Oh, that insolent princess!' cried the queen. "'To think that when we supposed her to be so miserable, she was all the while as happy as possible with that false king. But I know how we can avenge ourselves.' So the spy was ordered to go back and pretend to sleep as soundly as ever, and indeed she went to bed earlier than usual, and snored as naturally as possible, and the poor princess ran to the window and cried, Blue bird, blue as the sky, fly to me now, there's nobody by. But no bird came. All night long she called and waited and listened, but still there was no answer for the cruel queen had caused the fir tree to be hung all over with knives, swords, razors, shears, bill hooks, and sickles, so that when the blue bird heard the princess call and flew towards her, his wings were cut, and his little black feet clipped off, and all pierced and stabbed in twenty places, he fell back bleeding into his hiding place in the tree, and lay there groaning and despairing, for he thought the princess must have been persuaded to betray him to regain her liberty. Oh, Fiordelisa, can you indeed be so lovely and so faithless, he sighed. Then I may as well die at once. And he turned over on his side and began to die. But it happened that his friend, the enchanter, had been very much alarmed at seeing the frog chariot come back to him without King Charming, and had been round the world eight times seeking him, but without success. At the very moment when the king gave himself up to despair, he was passing through the wood for the eighth time and called, as he had done all over the world, Charming! King Charming, are you here? The king at once recognized his friend's voice and answered very faintly, I am here. The enchanter looked all round him but could see nothing, and then the king said again, I am a blue bird. Then the enchanter found him in an instant, and seeing his pitiable condition, ran hither and thither without a word, until he had collected a handful of magic herbs, with which, and a few incantations, he speedily made the king whole and sound again. Now, said he, let me hear all about it. There must be a princess at the bottom of this. There are two, answered King Charming with a wry smile. And then he told the whole story, accusing Fiordelisa of having betrayed the secret of his visits to make her peace with the queen, and indeed saying a great many hard things about her fickleness and her deceitful beauty, and so on. 
the enchanter quite agreed with him, and even went further, declaring that all princesses were alike, except perhaps in the matter of beauty, and advised him to have done with Fiordalisa and forget all about her. But, somehow or other, this advice did not quite please the king. "'What is to be done next?' said the enchanter, "'since you still have five years to remain a blue bird.' "'Take me to your palace,' answered the king. "'There you can at least keep me in a cage safe from cats and swords.' "'Well, that will be the best thing to do for the present,' said his friend. "'But I am not an enchanter for nothing. "'I am sure to have a brilliant idea for you before long.' "'In the meantime, Fjordelisa, quite in despair, "'sat at her window day and night, calling her dear blue bird in vain, "'and imagining over and over again all the terrible things "'that could have happened to him, until she grew quite pale and thin. "'As for the queen and Turritella, they were triumphant, "'but their triumph was short.' For the king, Fjordelisa's father, fell ill and died, and all the people rebelled against the queen and Turritella, and came in a body to the palace demanding Fjordelisa. The queen came out upon the balcony with threats and haughty words, so that at last they lost their patience and broke open the doors of the palace, one of which fell back upon the queen and killed her. Turritella fled to the fairy Mazzilla and all the nobles of the kingdom fetched the princess Fjordelisa from her prison in the tower and made her queen. Very soon, with all the care and attention they bestowed upon her, she recovered from the effects of her long captivity and looked more beautiful than ever, and was able to take counsel with her courtiers and arrange for the governing of her kingdom during her absence. And then, taking a bag full of jewels, she set out all alone to look for the blue bird without telling anyone where she was going. Meanwhile, the enchanter was taking care of King Charming, but as his power was not great enough to counteract the fairy Mozilla's, he at last resolved to go and see if he could make any kind of terms with her for his friend. For you see, fairies and enchanters are cousins in a sort of way, after all, and after knowing one another for five or six hundred years and falling out and making it up again pretty often, they understand one another well enough. So the fairy Mozilla received him graciously. And what may you be wanting, gossip? said she. You can do a good turn for me, if you will, he answered. A king who is a friend of mine was unlucky enough to offend you. Ah, I know who you mean, interrupted the fairy. I am sorry not to oblige you, gossip, but he need expect no mercy from me, unless he will marry my goddaughter, whom you see yonder looking so pretty and charming. Let him think over what I say. The enchanter hadn't a word to say, for he thought to retell a really frightful, but he could not go away without making one more effort for his friend the king, who was really in great danger as long as he lived in a cage. Indeed, already he had met with several alarming accidents. Once the nail on which his cage was hung had given way, and his feathered majesty had suffered much from the fall, while Madame Puss, who happened to be in the room at the time, had given him a scratch in the eye which came very near blinding him. Another time they had forgotten to give him any water to drink, so that he was nearly dead with thirst. And the worst thing of all was that he was in danger of losing his kingdom, for he had been absent so long that all his subjects believed him to be dead. So considering all these things, the enchanter agreed with the fairy Mozilla that she should restore the king to his natural form, and should take Turatella to stay in his palace for several months, and if, after the time was over, he still could not make up his mind to marry her, he should once more be changed into a blue bird. Then the fairy dressed Turritella in a magnificent gold and silver robe, and they mounted together upon a flying dragon, and very soon reached King Charming's palace, where he too had just been brought by his faithful friend, the Enchanter. Three strokes of the fairy's wand restored his natural form, and he was as handsome and delightful as ever, but he considered that he paid dearly for his restoration when he caught sight of Turritella, and the mere idea of marrying her made him shudder. Meanwhile, Queen Fjordelisa, disguised as a poor peasant girl, wearing a great straw hat that concealed her face, and carrying an old sack over her shoulder, had set out upon her weary journey, and had travelled far, sometimes by sea, and sometimes by land, sometimes on foot, and sometimes on horseback, but not knowing which way to go. She feared all the time that every step she took was leading her farther from her lover, one day, as she sat, quite tired and sad, on the bank of a little brook, cooling her white feet in the clear running water, and combing her long hair that glittered like gold in the sunshine, a little bent old woman passed by, leaning on a stick. She stopped and said to Fjordelisa, 
What, my pretty child, are you all alone? Indeed, good mother, I am too sad to care for company, she answered, and the tears ran down her cheeks. Don't cry, said the old woman, but tell me truly what is the matter. Perhaps I can help you. The queen told her willingly all that had happened and how she was seeking the blue bird. Thereupon the little old woman suddenly stood up straight and grew tall and young and beautiful, and said with a smile to the astonished Fiordelisa, Lovely queen, the king whom you seek is no longer a bird. My sister Mazzilla has given his own form back to him, and he is in his own kingdom. Do not be afraid. You will reach him, and will prosper. Take these four eggs. If you break one when you are in any great difficulty, you will find aid. So saying, she disappeared, and Fiordelisa, feeling much encouraged, put the eggs into her bag and turned her steps towards Charming's kingdom. After walking on and on for eight days and eight nights, she came at last to a tremendously high hill of polished ivory, so steep that it was impossible to get a foothold upon it. Fiordelisa tried a thousand times, and scrambled and slipped, but always in the end found herself exactly where she started from. At last she sat down at the foot of it in despair, and then suddenly bethought herself of the eggs. Breaking one quickly, she found in it some little gold hooks, and with these fastened to her feet and hands, she mounted the ivory hill without further trouble, for the little hooks saved her from slipping. As soon as she reached the top, a new difficulty presented itself, for all the other side, and indeed the whole valley, was one polished mirror, in which thousands and thousands of people were admiring their reflections. For this was a magic mirror, in which people saw themselves just as they wished to appear, and pilgrims came to it from the four corners of the world. But nobody had ever been able to reach the top of the hill, and when they saw Fiordelisa standing there, they raised a terrible outcry, declaring that if she set foot upon their glass, she would break it to pieces. The queen, not knowing what to do, for she saw it would be dangerous to try to go down, broke the second egg, and out came a chariot drawn by two white doves, and Fiordelisa got into it and was floated softly away. After a night and a day, the doves alighted outside the gate of King Charming's kingdom. Here the queen got out of the chariot and kissed the doves and thanked them, and then with a beating heart she walked into the town, asking the people she met where she could see the king. But they only laughed at her, crying, See the king! And pray, why do you want to see the king, my little kitchen maid? You had better go and wash your face first. Your eyes are not clear enough to see him. For the queen had disguised herself, and pulled her hair down about her eyes, that no one might know her. As they would not tell her, she went on farther, and presently asked again, and this time the people answered that tomorrow she might see the king driving through the streets with the princess Turatella, as it was said that at last he had consented to marry her. This was indeed terrible news to Fiordelisa. Had she come all this weary way only to find Turatella had succeeded in making King Charming forget her? She was too tired and miserable to walk another step, so she sat down in a doorway and cried bitterly all night long. As soon as it was light, she hastened to the palace, and after being sent away fifty times by the guards, she got in at last, and saw the throne set in the great hall for the king and Turatella, who was already looked upon as queen. Fiordelisa hid herself behind a marble pillar, and very soon saw Turatella make her appearance, richly dressed, but as ugly as ever, and with her came the king, more handsome and splendid, even than Fiordelisa had remembered him. When Turatella had seated herself upon the throne, the queen approached her. "'Who are you, and how dare you come near my high mightiness upon my golden throne?' said Turatella, frowning fiercely at her. "'They call me the little kitchen maid,' she replied. "'And I come to offer some precious things for sale.' And with that she searched in her old sack, and drew out the emerald bracelets King Charming had given her. "'Ha ha!' said Turatella. Those are pretty bits of glass. I suppose you would like five silver pieces for them. Show them to someone who understands such things, madam, answered the queen. After that, we can decide upon the price. Turatella, who really loved King Charming as much as she could love anybody, and was always delighted to get a chance of talking to him, now showed him the bracelets, asking how much he considered them worth. As soon as he saw them, he remembered those he had given to Fiordelisa, and turned very pale, and sighed deeply, and fell into such sad thought that he quite forgot to answer her. Presently she asked him again, and then he said with a great effort, 
I believe these bracelets are worth as much as my kingdom. I thought there was only one such pair in the world, but here, it seems, is another. Then Turritella went back to the queen and asked her what was the lowest price she would take for them. More than you would find it easy to pay, madam, answered she. But if you will manage for me to sleep one night in the Chamber of Echoes, I will give you the emeralds. By all means, my little kitchen maid, said Turritella, highly delighted. The king did not try to find out where the bracelets had come from, not because he did not want to know, but because the only way would have been to ask Turritella, and he disliked her so much that he never spoke to her if he could possibly avoid it. It was he who had told Fjordelisa about the Chamber of Echoes when he was a blue bird. It was a little room below the king's own bedchamber, and was so ingeniously built that the softest whisper in it was plainly heard in the king's room. Fjordelisa wanted to reproach him for his faithlessness, and could not imagine a better way than this. So when, by Turritella's orders, she was left there, she began to weep and lament, and never ceased until daybreak. The king's pages told Turritella, when she asked them, what a sobbing and sighing they had heard, and she asked Fjordelisa what it was all about. The queen answered that she often dreamed and talked aloud. But by an unlucky chance the king heard nothing of all this, for he took a sleeping drought every night before he lay down, and did not wake up until the sun was high. The queen passed the day in great disquietude. "'If he did hear me,' she said, "'could he remain so cruelly indifferent? But if he did not hear me, what could I do to get another chance? I have plenty of jewels, it is true, but nothing remarkable enough to catch Turritella's fancy. Just then she thought of the eggs, and broke one, out of which came a little carriage of polished steel ornamented with gold, drawn by six green mice. The coachman was a rose-colored rat, the position a gray one, and the carriage was occupied by the tiniest and most charming figures, who could dance and do wonderful tricks. Fjordelisa clapped her hands and danced for joy when she saw this triumph of magic art, and as soon as it was evening, went to a shady garden path down which she knew Turritella would pass, and then she made the mice gallop and the tiny people show off their tricks, and sure enough Turritella came, and the moment she saw it all cried, "'Little kitchen maid, little kitchen maid, what will you take for your mouse carriage?' And the queen answered, "'Let me sleep once more in the chamber of echoes.' "'I won't refuse your request, poor creature,' said Turritella condescendingly. And then she turned to her ladies and whispered, "'The silly creature does not know how to profit by her chances. So much the better for me.' When night came, Fjordelisa said all the loving words she could think of, but alas, with no better success than before, for the king slept heavily after his drought. One of the pages said, "'This peasant girl must be crazy,' but another answered, Yet what she says sounds very sad and touching. As for Fjordelisa, she thought the king must have a very hard heart if he could hear how she grieved, and yet pay her no attention. She had but one more chance, and on breaking the last egg, she found to her great delight that it contained a more marvelous thing than ever. It was a pie made of six birds, cooked to perfection, and yet they were all alive, and singing and talking, and they answered questions and told fortunes in the most amusing way. Taking this treasure, Fiordalisa once more set herself to wait in the great hall through which Turritella was sure to pass, and as she sat there, one of the king's pages came by and said to her, "'Well, little kitchen maid, it is a good thing that the king always takes a sleeping drought, for if not he would be kept awake all night by your sighing and lamenting.' Then Fiordalisa knew why the king had not heeded her, and taking a handful of pearls and diamonds out of her sack, she said, if you can promise me that tonight the king shall not have his sleeping drought, I will give you all these jewels. Oh, I, I promise that willingly, said the page. At this moment, Turritella appeared, and at the first sight of the savory pie, with the pretty little birds all singing and chattering, she cried, That is an admirable pie, little kitchen maid. Pray, what will you take for it? The usual price, she answered. To sleep once more in the chamber of echoes. "'By all means, only give me the pie,' said the greedy Turritella. And when night was come, Queen Fjordelisa waited until she thought everybody in the palace would be asleep, and then began to lament as before. "'Ah, oh, charming,' she said. "'What have I ever done that you should forsake me and marry Turritella? If you could only know all I have suffered, and what a weary way I have come to seek you!' 
Now the page had faithfully kept his word and given King Charming a glass of water instead of his usual sleeping drought. So there he lay wide awake and heard every word Fiordalisa said and even recognized her voice, though he could not tell where it came from. Oh, princess, he said, how could you betray me to our cruel enemies when I loved you so dearly? Fiordalisa heard him and answered quickly, Find out the little kitchen maid, and she will explain everything. Then the king, in a great hurry, sent for his pages and said, If you can find the little kitchen maid, bring her to me at once. Nothing could be easier, sire, they answered, for she is in the chamber of echoes. The king was very much puzzled when he heard this. How could the lovely princess Fiordalisa be a little kitchen maid? Or how could a little kitchen maid have Fiordalisa's own voice? So he dressed hastily and ran down a little secret staircase which led to the Chamber of Echoes. There, upon a heap of soft cushions, sat his lovely princess. She had laid aside all her ugly disguises and wore a white silken robe, and her golden hair shone in the soft lamplight. The king was overjoyed at the sight and rushed to throw himself at her feet and asked her a thousand questions without giving her time to answer one. Fiordalisa was equally happy to be with him once more, and nothing troubled them but the remembrance of the fairy Mozilla. But at this moment, in came the enchanter, and with him a famous fairy, the same, in fact, who had given Fiordalisa the eggs. After greeting the king and queen, they said that as they were united in wishing to help King Charming, the fairy Mozilla had no longer any power against him, and he might marry Fiordalisa as soon as he pleased. The king's joy may be imagined, and as soon as it was day, the news was spread through the palace, and everybody who saw Fiordalisa loved her directly. When Turatella heard what had happened, she came running to the king, and when she saw Fiordalisa with him, she was terribly angry. But before she could say a word, the enchanter and the fairy changed her into a big brown owl, and she floated away out of one of the palace windows, hooting dismally. Then the wedding night was held with great splendor, and King Charming and Queen Fiordalisa lived happily ever after. <laughs>